Hi, this is Brad Constantine, and you've reached the Book of Mormon Lecture Series. I've been teaching seminary and institute for the last 11 years, and uh, this is an attempt to do a deep dive into the Book of Mormon itself. I'm hoping that you'll find this uplifting and edifying. This is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but every attempt has been made to be as doctrinally accurate as possible. So if you're ready for a deep dive into the Book of Mormon, here we go. Hi, and welcome back to this Book of Mormon podcast. Today's discussion is going to be on Jacob chapter 5. Hope you have your seatbelt on because this is going to be quite a long one and, and uh, might get a little complicated here and there, so we'll try to make this understandable. First of all, by introduction, this is the allegory of the olive tree, and the olive tree represents the house of Israel. And uh, I'll read a couple of introductory paragraphs and items here so that we can kind of get a framework for the actual scriptures themselves. Um, it's interesting, though, the, the main overarching thing here, as I mentioned, that this is a history of the house of Israel. Um, and it also is indicative of the fact that God is very active, actively involved in our lives. He's actively involved. In fact, in, the, in this allegory, he says, let us go down three times. He is grieved because of the wickedness of the people. That's mentioned eight times. He says he's going to preserve the tree, and that's a, he says that 20 times. He says he's going to nourish the tree 22 times. He's going to prune it 10 times. He's going to dig around it 8 times. He's going to graft in things 22 times. He's going to pluck things off 9 times. He's going to lay up 8 times. He says all of those things to show that he is actively involved in the history of Israel, in our personal lives. He's taking an active part. He also says, what more could I have done? He mentions that 3 times. So let me just read you a couple of introductory paragraphs. Joseph Fielding Smith said, In brief, the allegory of Zenos records the history of Israel down through the ages, the scattering of the tribes to all parts of the earth. They're mingling with or being grafted in the wild olive trees, or in other words, the mixing of the blood of Israel among the Gentiles, by which the great blessings and promises of the Lord to Abraham were fulfilled. After Abraham had been proved, even to the extent of being willing to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, the Lord blessed him with the greatness of blessings and said to him, by, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Zenos' remarkable parable portrays how, as the branches of the olive tree, Israelites, were carried to all parts of the earth, the Lord's vineyard, and grafted into the wild olive tree, the Gentile nations. Thus they are fulfilling the promise that the Lord had made. Today, Latter-day Saints are going to all parts of the world as servants in the vineyard to gather this fruit and lay it in store for the time of the coming of the Master. This parable is one of the most enlightening and interesting in the Book of Mormon. How can any person read it without feeling the inspiration of this ancient prophet? And again, the complexity of this particular chapter again shows that this is translated material that Joseph Smith could not have made up. Also, by way of introduction, the allegory must be divided into three main sections. Section 1 is described by verses 1 through 14. Section 2 is described by verses 15 to 28. And section 3 is described by verses 29 to 75. Each of these sections is divided by the passage of a long time period. And that's in verses 15 and 29. Therefore, there are three main visits of the Lord and his servants to the vineyard. Each visit is separated by the passage of a lot of time. Keep this in mind as you read for the chronology of the allegory. Uh, for, the, for the chronology of the allegory is important and will help us with the correct interpretation. Another help is to understand what the figures in the allegory represent. And the Book of Mormon Institute manual gives us a really good key. For example, uh, the item of the vineyard, the interpretation of that is the world. The master of the vineyard is Jesus Christ. The servant is the Lord's prophets. The tame olive tree is the house of Israel or the Lord's covenant people. The wild olive tree are the Gentiles. The branches are groups of people. The roots of the tame olive tree is the gospel covenant and promises made by God that constantly give life and sustenance to the tree. The fruit of the tree is represented, uh, the interpretation is the lives or works of men. Digging, pruning, and fertilizing means the Lord's work with his children, which seeks to persuade them to be obedient and produce good fruit. Transplanting the branches is the scattering of groups throughout the world or restoring them to their original position. Grafting 
is the process of spiritual rebirth wherein one is joined to the covenant, decaying branches are wickedness and apostasy, and casting the branches into the fire is the judgment of God. So those are the basic uh, elements of the, of the vision or of the allegory and the interpretation of each of them. So that gives us a little bit of a head start here when we, as we read through it. Uh, one of the basic things to understand about the allegory is that there are five time periods talked about and four different groups or geographic locations of people. This is where it might be helpful to mark the scriptures. Uh, a simple way to identify the time periods is just that the, with the letters A, B, C, D, and E, a simple way to identify the various groups or branches of Israel is with the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. So let us first identify the groups of people and where they are led geographically by description from the allegory, and then we will mark the scriptures together so this allegory will become more understandable. First of all, group one, a tame olive tree in the land of Israel. This geographical area is easy to identify as ancient Israel or the land of Palestine located in and around Jerusalem, the holy city. Group number two is the poorest spot of ground in the vineyard, not easily identifiable as to where it is. It is far afield from Israel. <clears throat> could be the British Isles, could be a general category referring to, certain type, to a certain type of area where this branch was taken. Group three, a poorer spot of ground even than group two. Again, this is not easily identifiable as to where it is. It too is far afield from Israel. Could be the North Countries, where the 10 tribes were led around 721 BC or it could be a general category of land where the scattered tribes were scattered, a barren land without the covenants and blessings of the Lord. And group four, a good spot of ground, even choice above all other parts of the land of the vineyard, this land too is greatly separated geographically from the mother tree or the land of Israel. This land is where the children of Lehi were led. It is the land of the Nephites and the Lamanites. It is likely not only Central America, but the continents of North and South America. Next to the land of Israel, this is the easiest location to identify. And then the time periods are as follows. Period A, this is the earliest time when the covenants of Israel were put forth and includes some of the time of major scattering of the tribes of Israel. Some scholars feel that this could be tied from the time of Adam and the patriarchs down to the time of Abraham. Although this is possible, it is not likely. It probably dates from the time of Abraham around 2000 BC until the times of scattering, which would be around 720 to 600 BC. Period B, this is a long time after the first period. The, the scattering has taken place and the tribes are to be found around the mother tree and in at least three other areas around the vineyard. It appears that this time period is likely from about 721 to 600 BC until around 90 BC or thereabouts. The key to understanding this time period is where the good fruits are being found, specifically with group four, the Nephites and the Lamanites. And since the Lamanite converts did not begin until after about 92 BC with the mission of the four sons of Mosiah, it has to take place before this time. Period C, this is a long period of time after period B. The allegory says that time draweth near and the end soon cometh. This time period includes the time of the coming of Christ, the destructions of Jerusalem around A.D. 68 to 70, the destruction of the Nephites approximately A.D. 385, and includes a major portion of time into the Dark Ages or the time of apostasy, perhaps even up until the end of the 18th century or beginning of the 19th century, late 1700s or early 1800s. Period D, this is the last time that the vineyard is pruned and the harvest is brought in. It is the dispensation of the fullness of times. It is the period which includes the restoration of all the keys and up until the time of the second coming, it, be, it includes from at least 1820 until the end of this dispensation. It is a time period that is the shortest of all the time periods. It is a time of gathering where the covenants of Israel are reestablished in the land of Israel. Again, it is the last time. And period E, this is the millennial reign of the Lord. It is a thousand year period beginning just before the second coming of the Lord. No man knows the date of this time period. The signs of the time seem to point to a season potentially in the foreseeable future. So uh, let me just finish up here with another couple things. The following is a scripture marking exercise, though not meant to be comprehensive. It will help put a few of the things in place. First, let's mark the time periods in the margins next to the verses pertaining to those periods. You may want to draw a line marking each section of verses. You may want to color code those sections with a different colored line. You may want to just write in the verses that the time period covers, like time period A. So time period A begins with Jacob chapter 5, verse 4. 
and goes through verse 14. Time period B starts with verse 15 and goes through verse 28. Time period C starts with verse 29 and goes through approximately verse 49. Period D starts with verse 50 and goes to approximately verse 73. Verse, uh, period E begins with uh, 74 and goes to the end of, of the chapter, verse 77. The following is a scripture marking exercise that will help you identify the geographical locations and or, and or groups of people as identified above. Again, this is not meant to be comprehensive. You can place the letters next to the verses and this will help you keep them clear in your mind for future readings. Group 1 can be marked next to the following verses in Jacob 5, 16 to 19, 30 to 37, 52 and 53. Group 2 is represented by verses 20 to 22 and 39. Group 3 is verses 23 and 39. And group 4 can be marked next to 24 to 27, 39 to 46. It is noteworthy that Zenos spent a lot of time in detail on this last group, which was his own posterity, the children of Lehi. It's interesting to note that verse 44 is a clear reference to the destruction of the Jaredites before the Nephites and Lamanites spread forth upon the land. Joseph Fielding Smith said, but we have something in the Book of Mormon that if we did not have other truth expressed in it would be sufficient evidence of the divinity of this book. I have reference to the fifth chapter of Jacob. I think that as many as 99 out of every 100 who read the Book of Mormon read this parable through without grasping the fullness and meaning of it. And I think this is one of the greatest passages in the Book of Mormon. No matter how many times you have read the Book of Mormon, take a few minutes at some convenient time and sit down and just read carefully every word in the fifth chapter of the Book of Jacob. No greater parable was ever recorded. I tell you, my brothers and sisters, Joseph Smith did not write it. That was written by the inspiration of the Almighty. When you read that chapter through, if you cannot say in your soul, this is absolutely a revelation from God, then there is something wrong with you. And that was Joseph Filling Smith in answers to gospel questions. Won't it be interesting when, uh, that when we have the brass plates translated for us, we will see that this complicated chapter in Jacob came directly from those plates. Joseph Smith could only have translated this by the power of God. All right, we've already spent 12 minutes and we haven't even started reading yet. Um, all right, so what is the main purpose of the allegory? What it, who is it about? And... Um, and, that, and this is also to, sh to show us that God is doing everything he can to save us. In the Doctrine and Commentary, the Book of Mormon says, The allegory of Zenos is a prophecy of cosmic scope, an oracle without peer. It is of itself more than an adequate response to the allegation that the Book of Mormon is the work of a farm boy turned theologian. Its complexity, combined with its consistency, bears eloquent witness that the Book of Mormon came through Joseph Smith, not from him. The allegory of the it is to show us how kind the Lord is in extending every effort to have us come to him. All right, here we go. Verse 1. Behold, my brethren, do you not remember to have read? The allegory is not something new to the Nephites. Jacob is here reminding his people of writings which, with which they were already familiar. That's from Millet and McConkie. The words of the prophet Zenos. It would appear that Zenos was one of the prophets whose oracles were recorded on the brass plates. He would have lived sometime before Lehi, probably in the northern tribes of Israel, before the Assyrian captivity of the ten tribes. Little McConkie said, I do not think it, I overstate the matter when I say that, that next to Isaiah himself, who is the prototype pattern and model for all the prophets, there was not a greater prophet in all Israel than Zenos. We properly make a distinction between a prophet and the prophet. In our day, we testify of many who are prophets while normally reserving the phrase the prophet for Joseph Smith who stands at the head of our dispensation. Zenos was of such greatness that he is properly referred to as the prophet. Continuing verse one, which he spake unto the house of Israel saying, hearken, O ye house of Israel, and hear the words of me, a prophet of the Lord. This is what might be called the doctrine of ambiguity. On some matters, God has simply not spoken, has not given a complete understanding of the people of the church, to the people of the church on many matters, a fuller final interpretation of the prophetic word is yet to come. This would certainly be the case in regard to the allegory of Zenos. There are definite themes or underlying messages, broad and clear statements which are read, readily discernible. There is also a host of historical or doctrinal particulars about which we might speculate or conjecture, but for which a definite and clear interpretation has not yet been made, known by living apostles or prophets. That was from Doctrinal Commentary of the Book of Mormon. Verse 3. For behold, thus saith the Lord, I will liken thee, O house of Israel, 
So the allegory covers the time period from about 1700 BC, the founding of the House of Israel to the end of the world, like unto a tame olive tree. Some uh, background of, of tame olive trees or olive trees in general. A tame olive tree is one that is cultivated by the, by the master of the vineyard, specifically grown to produce good olives. The olive tree is a carefully chosen simile for several reasons. For centuries, the olive branch has been associated with peace. When the dove returned to Noah in the ark, it carried in its beak an olive leaf, as though to symbolize that the earth was again at peace with God. The olive branch was used in both Greece and Rome to signify peace, and it is still used in that sense in the great seal of the United States, where the American eagle is shown grasping an olive branch in his talons. There is further symbolic evidence or significance in that the olive tree is different from most other fruit-bearing trees in the manner of its beginning. If the green slip of an olive tree is merely planted and allowed to grow, it develops into the wild olive, a bush that grows without control into a tangle of limbs and branches that produce only a small worthless fruit. To become the productive tame olive tree, the main stem of the wild tree must be cut back completely, and then a branch from a tame olive tree must be grafted into the stem of the wild one. With careful pruning and cultivating, the tree will begin to produce its first fruit in about seven years, but it will not become fully productive for nearly 15 years. In other words, the olive tree cannot become productive in and of itself. It requires grafting by the husbandman to bring it into production. One remembers the figure used by Jesus to describe himself, his father, and those that serve him, that serve them. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Know ye, know, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And that was John 15, 1 to 3. The word purgeth in Greek means pruned. And in Greek, verse 3 keeps the metaphor and says, now ye are pruned. God is the husbandman and prunes off the wild branches of our spiritual lives if we will but submit to his tender care. Thus we become the tame, thus we become like the tame olive tree. The wild olive is a kind of reversion to the primitive plant, such as occurs also with the fig and almond, and it takes place whenever the growth of the olive is neglected. In most neglected olive groves, numerous little bushes of the of the wild olive may be seen, which though very unlike, very unlike the cultivated tree, having a shorter, smaller, and greener leaf and a stiffer, more prickly stem are nevertheless derived from it. As a rule, the wild olive is but a shrub, but it may grow into a tree and have small but useless berries. Where groves of wild olives are found in Palestine, they are probably always the descendants of cultivated trees long ago destroyed. The olive tree is remarkable for two other characteristics that are quite unlike their fruit-bearing trees. First, though requiring nearly 15 years to come into full production, it may produce fruit for centuries. Some trees now growing in the Holy Land have been producing abundantly for at least 400 years. The second amazing quality of the tree is that it finally does grow old and begin to die. The roots send up a number of new green shoots, which if grafted and pruned in regular fashion, will mature to full grown olive trees again. Thus, while the tree itself may produce fruit for centuries, the root of the tree may go on producing fruit and new trees for millennia. It is believed that some of the ancient olive trees in Israel today may uh, come from trees that were in existence when Christ was alive on the earth. And that's from the Book of Mormon student manual. Continuing verse 3, which a man, Jesus Christ, took and nourished. He sends prophets, gives revelation, organizes his church, bestows priesthood and powers, and does all that the people will allow to make the blessings of his gospel available to his people, the house of Israel. That's from Doctrinal Commentary of the Book of Mormon. Continuing verse 3, I keep interrupting, don't I? This is what I do in my classes. Every time somebody reads a verse of scripture, I stop them in the middle of the verse uh, to discuss things. If you don't like that, sorry. In his vineyard, verse 3, continuing, in his vineyard, which is the world, and it grew and waxed old and began to decay. The time period of this is unclear. The, this passage describing when the house of Israel begins to decay could be interpreted to refer to the time when Israel decided to establish a king, or it might be after their lengthy sojourn in Egypt. Verse 4, and it came to pass that the master of the vineyard went forth, and he saw that his olive tree began to decay. In other words, apostasy. And he said, I will prune it, the chastening of his chosen people, and dig about it and nourish it, that perhaps it may shoot forth young and tender branches. The emergence of a righteous element of the house of Israel. This might be the rising generation of Israel being allowed to enter Canaan after the 40 years in the wilderness. And it perished not. And it came to pass that he pruned it and digged about it and nourished it according to his word. 
And it came to pass that after many days it began to put forth somewhat a little young and tender branches, but behold, the main top thereof began to perish. In other words, the older generation, steeped in sinful traditions, had become comfortable in their iniquity. Verse 7, And it came to pass that the master of the vineyard saw it, and he said unto his servant, the prophet or prophets, It grieveth me that I should lose this tree. The Lord loves his people, the literal seed of Abraham. Wherefore, go and pluck the branches from a wild olive tree, the Gentiles, and bring them hither unto me, and we will pluck off those main branches which are beginning to wither away, and we will cast them into the fire, that they may be burned. The scattering of Israel by the Assyrians and Babylonians, about 735 to 587 B.C. And behold, saith the Lord of the vineyard, I take away many of these young and tender branches. So he's scattering them, and I will graft them whithersoever I will. They're going to be scattered throughout the world. And it mattereth not that if it so be that the root of this tree will perish, I may preserve the fruit thereof unto myself. Wherefore, I will take these young and tender branches, and I will graft them whithersoever I will. Grafting in is joining the church. Take thou the branches of the wild olive tree and graft them in, in the stead thereof, and these which I have plucked off I will cast into the fire and burn them, that they may not cumber the ground of my vineyard. And it came to pass that the servant of the Lord of the vineyard did according to the word of the Lord of the vineyard and grafted in the branches of the wild olive tree. And the Lord of the vineyard caused that it should be digged about and pruned and nourished saying unto his servant, It grieveth me that I should lose this tree, wherefore that perhaps I might preserve the roots. The roots may refer to the blood of Israel, therefore they, that they perish not, thereof that they perish not, that I might preserve them unto myself. I have done this thing. Wherefore go thy way, watch the tree, and nourish it according to my words. The prophets look after the people. Uh, this may be Ezekiel, Daniel, Malachi, Nephi, Jacob, and Alma. And these will I place in the nethermost part, these are scattered to the four, part, four corners of the earth, of my vineyard, whithersoever I will, it mattereth not unto thee, and I do it, that I may preserve unto myself the natural branches of the tree. The purpose of the scattering is to preserve those literal Israelites who have demonstrated their loyalty and faithfulness, and also that I may lay up fruit thereof against the season unto myself, for it grieveth me that I should lose this tree and the fruit thereof. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard went his way and hid the natural branches, the Lehites and Mulekites were hidden from the rest of the world. Of the tame olive tree and the nethermost parts of the vineyard, some in one and some in another, according to his will and pleasure. Israel is scattered throughout the world. And it came to pass that a long time passed away. This may be from the time of Malachi, about 400 BC, to a time just beyond that of the ministry of Christ. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, Come, let us go down into the vineyard, and that we may labor in the vineyard. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard and also the servant went down into the vineyard to labor. And it came to pass that the servant said unto his master, Behold, look here, behold the tree. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard looked and beheld the tree in the which the wild branches, wild olive branches have been grafted. The Samaritans and the Gentiles that Peter and Paul preached to, the early Christian church flourished with the conversion of many Gentiles. And it had sprung forth and begun to bear fruit. And he beheld that it was good. And the fruit thereof was like unto the natural fruit. And he said unto the servant, Behold, the branches of the wild olive tree have taken hold of the moisture, the living waters of the gospel, of the root thereof. In the real world, this does not happen. The wild branches will not bring forth tame fruit. This is to show the miracle that the gospel can make saints out of Gentiles. That the root thereof hath brought forth much strength, and because of the much strength of the root thereof, the wild branches have brought forth tame fruit. When we make covenants in the gospel, we bring forth works of righteousness. In John 4, the Samaritans were ready to harvest. The Samaritans were a graft into the house of Israel. Now, if we have, now if we had not grafted in these branches, the tree thereof would have perished. In other words, converts, both Israelite and Gentile, are the lifeblood of the church. And now, behold, I shall lay up much fruit, which the fruit which the tree thereof hath brought forth, and the fruit thereof I shall lay up against the season unto mine own self. And it, came to, and it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said unto the servant, Come, let us go. The Lord is going to visit his, his scattered Israel to the nethermost part of the vineyard. And behold, if the natural branches of the tree have not brought forth much fruit also, that I may lay up of the fruit thereof against the season unto mine own self. And it came to pass that they went forth, and with, whither the master had hid the natural branches of the tree. And he said unto the servant, Behold these. And he beheld the first. The Lord of the vineyard and his servant now visit the three branches of Israel scattered in the nethermost part of the vineyard. Exactly who is being represented here by the first two groups is unclear. The third group seems to be an obvious reference to the Lehites, 
Some writers have suggested the possibility that the three are the ten tribes, scattered Jews, and Lehites. For all we know, the three groups may symbolize the scattering of numerous branches of Israel, many of which we simply have no knowledge of. That's from Doctrinal Commentary of the Book of Mormon. Continuing verse 20, that it had brought forth much fruit, and he beheld also that it was good. And he said unto the servant, Take of the fruit thereof, and lay it up against the season, that I may preserve it unto myself. For behold, saith he, that this long time have I nourished it, and it hath brought forth much fruit. And it came to pass that the servant said unto his master, How comest thou hither to plant this tree, or this branch of the tree? For behold, it was the poorest spot in all the land of thy vineyard. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto him, Counsel me not. I knew that it was a poor spot of ground. Wherefore I said unto thee, I have nourished it this long time. And thou beholdest that it hath brought forth much fruit. We're not sure exactly who this first branch is, but the, the, the message here, though, is it doesn't matter if we're born into a poor family or an inactive family or families that are not members of the church, that the Lord can nourish us and that we can still be active and true and faithful in the gospel. It doesn't matter about our background or where we're from or what land we come from. Uh, the Lord's going to always bless us uh, if we're keeping the commandments and doing the things we're supposed to. Verse 23, And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, Look hither, behold, I have planted another branch. We're not sure who this branch is either, of the tree also. And thou, be, and thou knowest that this spot of ground was poorer than the first poorer than the verse in verse 21. But behold, the tree, I have nourished it this long time, and, and it hath brought forth much fruit. Therefore, gather it and lay it up against the season, that I may preserve it unto myself. Again, it doesn't matter the situations that we're born into. We still uh, will have the blessings of the Lord. He'll still bless us, uh, even though we might come from poor, poor roots, poor heritage. Verse 24, And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said again unto his servant, Look hither. And behold, another branch, and this is the Lehites, also which I have planted. Behold, I have nourished it also, and it hath brought forth fruit. Joseph Fielding Smith said, Now in that parable, the olive tree is the house of Israel, as I have said. It is native land. It, in its native land, it began to die. So the Lord took branches like the Nephites, like the lost tribes, and like others that the Lord let off that we do not know anything about to other parts of the earth. He planted them all over the, his vineyard, which is which is the world. No doubt he sent some of these branches into Japan, into Korea, into China. No question about it, because he sent them to all parts of the world. Time came when in these distant parts the trees began to decay, so the Lord sent out for the, for the last time to gather the fruit into the harvest. Now there is your answer. That is the answer to these people who approached me with the question, what's the use of going out among the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans, and the people of the Far East to preach the gospel to them? The answer, because they are branches of the tree. They are of the house of Israel. The Lord took the branches of the tree, grafted them into the wild olives, the Gentiles, and is bringing the Gentiles into the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you read that chapter through, if you cannot say in your soul, this is absolutely a revelation from God, then there is something wrong with you. That tells you of history. We are going to preach the gospel in Korea, in Japan, in China. Yes, we are. Why? Because the blood of Israel is there. And the Lord did just what he said he would do with Abraham and his posterity. He scattered them over the whole face of the earth. So now the Gentiles are scattered by the blood of Abraham. Verse 25, And he said unto the servant, Look hither, and behold the last, and behold, this have I planted in a good spot of ground, the Americas. And I have nourished it this long time, and only a part of the tree hath brought forth tame fruit, meaning the Nephites. And the other part of the tree hath brought forth wild fruit, meaning the Lamanites. Behold, I have nourished this tree, the Lehites, like unto the others. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said unto the servant, Pluck off the branches that have not brought forth good fruit, and cast them into the fire. The more wicked members of the church will be removed. But behold, the servant said unto him, Let us prune it, and dig about it, and nourish it a little longer, that perhaps it may bring forth good fruit unto thee, that thou canst lay it up against the season. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard and the servant of the vineyard, of the servant of the Lord of the vineyard, did nourish all the fruit of the vineyard. And it came to pass that a long time, now we're talking about another 1,500 years or so, had passed away. When the gospel sun went down almost two millennia ago, when the priesthood was taken away and a dreary dusk descended in the congregations that once had known light, when light and truth no longer shone forth from heaven, and when those on the earth no longer were taught and directed by apostles and prophets, then the spiritual darkness reigned. Darkness covered the earth and gross darkness the minds of the people. The dark ages had their beginning, and the light of heaven no longer dwelt in the hearts of those who professed to worship him 
whose we are. True, the heavens still teemed with stars, an uncounted host of them, for there were many wise and good people who reflected forth to others such light and truth and goodness as they had. And month after month, a new moon arose to reflect such of heaven's truths as came by instinct and from reason. There was St. Augustine, a Mahamadis, a Joan of Arc, a Thomas More, a Michelangelo, a Galileo, a host of others, each for the month when their moons shone, <clears throat> who reflected such borrowed light as in their power lay. But the light of heaven no longer shed its rays on the straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life. But finally, the heralds of a distant dawn came forth. There was a Calvin, a, Z a Zingli, uh, a Luther, a, Wels a Wesley. They were wise and good men, morning stars who shone more brightly than their fellows, who arose in every nation. There were men of insight and courage who were sickened by the sins and evils of the night. These great souls hacked and sought at the chains with which the masses were bound. They sought to do good and to help their fellow men, all according to the best light and knowledge they had. When the set time had fully come, when the day for the promised restoration of all things was at hand, the Lord in heaven, in his infinite wisdom, mercy, and goodness, sent, for, sent from the courts of glory that eternal spirit whose foreordained mission it was to usher in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Joseph Smith began his mortal life. It was December 23rd, 1805. The sun was then just hidden by the mountain peaks. Bruce R. McConkie. Back to verse 29. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, Come, let us go down into the vineyard, that we may labor again in the vineyard. For behold, the time draweth near, and the end soon cometh. Wherefore, I must lay up fruit against the season unto mine own self, the dispensation of the fullness of times. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard and the servant went down into the vineyard, and they came to the tree whose natural branches had been broken off, and the wild branches had been grafted in. And behold, all sorts of fruit did cumber the tree. This has reference to many Christian churches in the last days, none of which were the true church, when he mentions all sorts of fruit. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard did taste of the fruit, the Lord is the ultimate <clears throat> judge of the goodness of the fruits, every sort according to its number. And the Lord of the vineyard said, Behold, this long time, in other words, God's patience, shows he will not let Israel go. Have we nourished this tree? And I have laid up unto myself against the season much fruit. But behold, this time it hath brought forth much fruit, and there is none of it which is good. There was no true church among all the Christian churches. <clears throat> Remember what Joseph Smith said in, uh, as he had his vision. Um, Joseph Smith said, I was enwrapped in a heavenly vision and saw two glorious personages who exactly resembled each other in features and likeness, surrounded with a brilliant light which eclipsed the sun at noonday. They told me that all the religious denominations were believing in incorrect doctrines and that none of them was acknowledged of God as his church and kingdom, and I was expressly commanded to, know, to go not after them. At the same time, receiving a promise that the fullness of the gospel should at some future time be made known unto me. Continuing verse 32, and behold, there are all kinds of bad fruit, and it profiteth me nothing, notwithstanding all our labor, and now it grieveth me that I should lose this tree. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto the servant, What shall we do unto the tree that I may preserve again good fruit thereof unto mine own self? And the servant said unto his master, Behold, because thou didst graft in the branches of the wild olive tree, they have nourished the roots, that they are alive, and that they have not perished. The basic concepts of Christianity are not dead. Wherefore thou beholdest that they are yet good. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, The tree profiteth me nothing, and the roots thereof profit me nothing, so long as it shall bring forth evil fruit. Even though the Christian churches have some truth, if they don't have the proper authority, it is good for nothing. Nevertheless, I know that the roots are good, the gospel is true, for my, and for mine own purpose I have preserved them, and because of their much strength they have hitherto brought forth from the wild branches good fruit. This is from Erastus Snow. He says, Their blood has permeated European society and it coursed in the veins of the early colonists of America. This is the blood that has been foremost among those spirits who have come forth to accept the gospel. Those who did not wait for the elders to hunt, hunt them from the hills and corners of the earth, but they were hunting for the elders, impelled by a spirit which then they could not understand. And for this reason were they among the first elders of the church, they and the fathers having been watched over from the days that God promised the, those blessings upon Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Ephraim. And these are they that will be found in the front ranks of all that is noble and good in their day and time, and who will be found among those whose efforts are directed in establishing upon the earth <clears throat> uh, those heaven-born principles which tend directly to blessing and salvation, to ameliorating the condition of their fellow men. 
and elevating them in the scale of their being and among those also who receive the fullness of the everlasting gospel and the keys of the priesthood in the last days, through whom God determined to gather up again unto himself a peculiar people, a holy nation, a pure seed that shall stand upon Mount Zion as saviors, not only to the house of Israel, but also to the house of Esau. So he's talking here about the pilgrims and those that came looking for the gospel. Uh, they, were, they were among the first to join the church. Verse 37, but behold, the wild branches have grown and have overrun. In other words, the philosophies of men, Greeks or humanistic, had suppressed the truth and driven the church of God into the wilderness. The roots thereof, and because that the wild branches have overcome the roots thereof, it hath brought forth much evil fruit. And because that it hath brought forth so much evil fruit, thou beholdest that it beginneth to perish. There is so much confusion among the Christian churches that no one knows the truth of the gospel. This time period is from about A.D. 100 to about 1820. And it will soon become ripened that it may be cast into the fire, except we should do something for it to preserve it. In other words, to restore the gospel. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, Let us go down into the nethermost parts of the vineyard, and behold, if the natural branches have also brought forth evil fruit, and it came to pass that they went down into the nethermost parts of the vineyard, and it came to pass that they beheld that the fruit of the natural branches had become corrupt also. Yea, the fruit, meaning the northern kingdom of Ephraim, and the second, meaning the Jews, and also the last, the Lehites, and they had all become corrupt. In other words, the, the apostasy was universal. It had been uh, in all throughout the vineyard, throughout the whole world. And, uh, verse 40, and the wild fruit of the last had overcome that part of the tree which brought forth good fruit. In other words, the Lamanites had killed off all the Nephites, even that the branch, the Nephites, had withered away and died. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard wept and said unto the servant, what could I have done more for my vineyard? So notice that the Lord is doing everything he possibly can. He's not an absent God. He is here doing everything he possibly can for the welfare of his children. Elder Holland said, there is much more here than simply the unraveling of conv convoluted Israelite history. Of greater significance in this allegory is the benevolent view of God that it provides. He is portrayed here as one who repeatedly, painstakingly, endlessly tries to save the work of his hands and in moments of greatest disappointment, holds his head in his hands and weeps. What could I have done more for my vineyard? This allegory is a declaration of divine love, of God's unceasing effort as a father laboring on behalf of his children. As one writer has noted, Zenos's allegory ought to take its place beside the parable of the prodigal son. Both stories make the Lord's mercy so movingly memorable. Also, Elder Packer said, how many bishops with disappointing results have felt to say those very words in their souls? What could I have done more for my ward? Why, 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 why? Boy, I can't say it. Why? Wild fruit after all our work. It was the servant. It always is the servant who said, is, is it not the loftiness of thy vineyard? Have not the branches thereof overcome the roots which are good? And because the branches have overcome the roots thereof, behold, they grew faster than the strength of the roots, taking strength unto themselves. Verse 42. Behold, I knew that all the fruit of the vineyard, save it were these, had become corrupted. And now these which I have once brought forth good fruit have also become corrupted. And now all the trees of my vineyard are good for nothing, save it be to be hewn down and cast into the fire. And behold, this last whose branch hath withered away, the Lehites I did plant in a good spot of ground. In other words, America. Yea, even that which was choice unto me above all other parts of the land of my vineyard. And thou beheldest that I also cut down that which <clears throat> cumbered this spot of ground the Jaredites, <clears throat> that I might plant this tree in the stead thereof, the Lehites. And thou beheldest that a part thereof brought forth good fruit, the Nephites, and a part thereof brought forth wild fruits, or Lamanites. And because I pluck not the branches thereof and cast them into the fire, behold, they have overcome the good branch that it hath withered away. The Lamanites have destroyed the Nephites. And now behold, notwithstanding all the care which we have taken of my vineyard, the trees thereof have become corrupted. False influences overcame the pure doctrines and practices of the gospel, and a an, an universal apostasy prevailed, <clears throat> that, they, that they bring forth no good fruit. And these I have hoped to preserve, to have laid up fruit thereof against the season unto mine own self. But behold, they have become like unto the wild olive tree, and they are of no worth but to be hewn down and cast into the fire. And it grieveth me that I should lose them. Uh, that's talking about the Lamanites again, dwindling in unbelief. Verse 47, but what could I have done more in my vineyard? Have I slackened mine hand that I have not nourished it? Nay, I have nourished it, and I have digged about it, and I have pruned it, 
and I have done it, and I have stretched forth mine hand almost all the day long. And the end draweth nigh, and it grieveth me that I should hew down all the trees of my vineyard and cast them into the fire, that they should be burned. Who is it that has corrupted my vineyard? And it came to pass that the servant said unto his master, Is it not the loftiness of thy vineyard? Have not the branches thereof overcome the roots which are good? Pride caused the apostasy. The church must never grow faster than the leadership can handle. And because the branches have overcome the roots thereof, behold, they grew faster than the strength of the roots, taking strength unto themselves. Don't rely simply upon your own merits and talents. Rely on the Lord for help in all things. Behold, I say, is not this the cause that the trees of thy vineyard have become corrupted? There are so many false churches that take authority unto themselves that all are corrupt. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said unto the servant, Let us go down, let us go to and hew down the trees of the vineyard and cast them into the fire, that they shall not cumber the ground of my vineyard, for I have done all. What could I have done more for my vineyard? But behold, the servant said unto the Lord of the vineyard, Spare it a little longer. And the Lord said, Yea, I will spare it a little longer, for it grieveth me that I should lose the trees of my vineyard. Wherefore, let us take of the branches of these which I have planted in the nethermost parts of my vineyard, in other words, the lost tribes of Israel, and let us graft them. The pure blood of Israel is being gathered. The gathering also includes the Gentiles. Into the tree from whence they came, the restoration of the gospel and the gathering of the seed of Abraham has begun. And let us pluck from the tree those branches whose fruit is most bitter and graft in the natural branches, the true blood descendants of Israel of the tree in the stead thereof. And this will I do that the tree may not perish. In other words, the gospel to be restored, that perhaps I may preserve unto myself the roots thereof for mine own purpose. Uh, Moses said, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. That's God's purpose. And behold, the roots of the natural branches of the tree, which I planted whithersoever I would, are yet alive. Israel is to be gathered. Wherefore, that I may preserve them also for mine own purpose, I will take the branches of this tree, and I will graft them in, a, in unto them. Yea, I will graft in unto them the branches of their mother tree. Those that are gathered into the church are for the most part literal descendants of Israel. The gathering of the branches began in the spring of 1820 in a grove of trees. That I may preserve the roots also unto mine own self, that, they, that when they shall be sufficiently strong, the church will need to have a time to grow and develop. Perhaps they may bring forth good fruit unto me, and I may yet have glory in the fruit of my vineyard. To the missionaries of the latter days, the Lord has said, Ye are called to bring to pass the gathering of mine elect, or... For the, for the Lord explained, mine elect hear my voice and harden not their hearts. For theirs was a believing blood. What then is believing blood? It is the blood that flows in the veins of those who are the literal seed of Abraham. Not that the blood itself believes, but that those born in that lineage have both the right and a special spiritual capacity to recognize, receive, and believe the truth. The term is simply a beautiful, poetic, and a symbolic way of referring to the seed of Abraham to whom the promises were made. It identifies those who developed in pre-existence the talent to recognize the truth and to desire righteousness. And that was from McConkie and, McKillid, uh, McConkie and Millet in the Doctrinal Commentary of the Book of Mormon. Verse 55, And it came to pass that they took from the natural tree, which had become wild, the apostate church, and grafted in unto the natural branches the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, which also had become wild. And they also took of the natural trees, which had become wild, and grafted into their mother tree. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto the servant, Pluck not the wild branches from the trees. Let the wicked grow among the faithful for a time, save it be those which are most bitter. We don't excommunicate every person who struggles with the word of wisdom, nor should we disfellowship those of our brethren and sisters of the faith who innocently err in doctrine. Serious sins must be appropriately dealt with, and in them ye shall graft according to that which I have said. 58. And we will nourish again the trees of the vineyard. The gospel will be taught to the descendants of Israel through the, throughout the world. And we will trim up the branches thereof to chasten the members of the church so that they will repent, the purifying of the saints, the preparation of the bride for the bridegroom. And we will pluck from the trees those branches which are ripened. In other words, excommunicating those that need to be excommunicated. That must perish and cast them into the fire. And this I do, that perhaps the roots thereof may take strength because of their goodness and because of the change of the branches, that the good may overcome the evil. In other words, missionary work will be successful. The allegory makes it clear that the grafting and pruning process, the gathering of Israel and the trying of the nations of the earth will continue simultaneously until the, until the millennium. This means that as the saints accept <clears throat> and assimilate additional nourishment from their scriptural sources, the Lord will require a higher level of performance. Thus, the allegory foresees in the grafting and pruning process 
a reversal of what President Benson has called the Samuel Principle. According to this principle, within certain bounds, God grants unto men according to their desires. The principle received its name from the story of 1 Samuel 8, where the people of Israel demand contrary to the wishes of God and his prophet Samuel that God gave them a king. God granted them their desire to their own eventual sorrow. The reverse of the Samuel principle during the restoration can be illustrated by the word of wisdom. As the saints assimilated and lived the word of wisdom, God saw fit to require a more strict application of it. Until today, it is often used as a measure of a member's commitment to the kingdom. Other examples of additional nourishment must include the material in sections 137 and 138 of the Doctrine and Covenants. These revelations were just as true when they were received as when they were accepted by the church as scripture in 1976, and therefore as binding on the membership, perhaps as the allegory and principle suggests. The members were capable in 1976 of submitting themselves to the additional instruction available in these visions, both the initial gift of the Word of Wisdom in 1833 and its subsequent development in the church and, and the addition of sections 137 and 138 to the canon are modern examples of how our scriptural heritage, our roots, may take additional strength because of their goodness. In the future, as we are faithful in assimilating the nourishment from the roots, we can look forward to an even greater scriptural heritage for God will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That was from Stephen Ricks and John Welch in the Allegory of the Olive Tree. Verse 60, And because that I have preserved the natural branches meaning the house of Israel and the roots thereof, the gospel, and that I have grafted in the natural branches again into their mother tree. These are the literal seed of Abraham and have preserved the roots of their mother tree that perhaps the trees of my vineyard may bring forth again good fruit and that I may have joy again in the fruit of my vineyard. And perhaps that I may rejoice exceedingly that I have preserved the roots and the branches of the first fruit. Wherefore, go to and call servants, prophets, apostles, and missionaries, that we may labor diligently with our might in the vineyard. Notice that we, that God is working with us. This isn't just us, but it's we, us and our Heavenly Father, that we may prepare the way. Joseph Smith was an Elias preparing the way for the Messiah. That I may bring forth again the natural fruit, the house of Israel which natural fruit is good and the most precious above all other fruit, the favored lineage. Wherefore, let us go to and labor with our might this last time, the preaching of the gospel by the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the last days. For behold, the end draweth nigh, the millennium is coming soon, and this is for the last time that I shall prune my vineyard. Graft in the branches, in other words, gather Israel, begin at the last, start among the Gentiles, meaning the nation of Gentiles, that they may be first, and the first, meaning the Jews, may be last, and dig about the trees, both old and young, the first first and the last and the last and the first. The Lord has a divine timetable wherein the gospel is presented to the people on earth. In the meridian of time, the gospel went first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. In our day, the message of the restoration is taken first to the Gentiles, Israelites scattered among the identif and identified with the Gentiles, and then to the house of Israel, meaning specifically the Lamanites and the Jews. Thus the first, the Jews, shall in the last days be last. And the last, the Gentiles, shall in the final dispensation be first. Doctrinal Commentary of the Book of Mormon. That all may be nourished once again for the last time. The preaching of the gospel to all of Israel. Wherefore, dig about them and prune them and dung them once more for the last time. For the end draweth nigh. And if it so be that these gr last grafts will, shall grow and bring forth the natural fruit, then shall ye, be, ye prepare the way for them, that they may grow, the church to grow. And as they begin to grow, ye shall clear away the branches which bring forth bitter fruit according to the strength of the good and the size thereof. And ye shall not clear away the bad thereof all at once, lest the roots thereof should be too strong for the graft and the graft thereof shall perish. And I lose the tree of, trees of my vineyard. In other words, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Let the tares grow among the wheat until the wheat is sufficiently strong. Then gather and bind the tares for burning. For it grieveth me that I should lose the trees of my vineyard. God loves all his children and does not want to lose any of them. Wherefore, ye shall clear away the bad according as the good shall grow. And the root and the top may be equal in strength until the good shall overcome the bad and the bad be hewn down and cast into the fire that they cumber not the ground of my vineyard. And thus will I sweep away the bad out of my vineyard. The wicked will be destroyed at the second coming, leaving the righteous. And the branches of the natural tree will I graft in again into the natural tree. After the second coming and during the millennium, the gathering of Israel will continue. And the branches of the natural tree will I graft into the natural branches of the tree. And thus will I bring to them together again, that they shall bring forth the natural fruit and they shall be one. This is when the Jews will finally accept Christ. The tribes of Ephraim and Judah <clears throat> will become one. All of Israel will be in the church during the millennium. 
and the bad shall be cast away. The end of the world is the destruction of the wicked. Yea, even out of all the land of my vineyard, for behold, only this once will I prune my vineyard. The wicked will be destroyed at the second coming. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard sent his servant, <clears throat> and the servant went and did as the Lord had commanded him, and brought other servants, and they were few, few in comparison to the rest of the world, but still there will be many. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto them, Go to and labor in the vineyard with your might. For behold, this is the last time that I shall nourish my vineyard, for the end is nigh at hand, and the season speedily cometh. And if ye labor with your might with me, ye shall have joy in the fruit which I shall lay up unto myself against the season, against the time which will soon come. Great shall be your joy in bringing, save it be one into my kingdom. And it came to pass that the servants did go and labor with their mites, and the Lord of the vineyard labored also with them. President Harold B. Lee spoke the following penetrating words as he closed a general conference. There has come to me in these last few days a deepening and reassuring faith. I can't leave this conference without saying to you that I have a conviction that the master hasn't been absent from us on these occasions. This is his church. <clears throat> Where else would we would he rather be than right here at the headquarters of his church? Isn't He isn't an absent man. An absentee master. He is concerned about us. He wants us to follow where he leads. Continuing verse 72, and they did uh, and, and they did obey the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard in all things, faithful and true servants of the Lord, the apostles and prophets and faithful members of the church who magnify their callings and teach their families. 73, and there began to be the natural fruit again in the vineyard, and the natural branches began to grow and thrive exceedingly. During the millennium, the church will grow faster than ever before because Satan will be bound. The work of gathering will go forward in an unprecedented manner during the thousand years of peace. There will be hosts of non-members of the church, and for that matter, numerous churches on the earth as the millennium begins. But such shall not be the case as the glory of the millennium grows in intensity through the thousand years. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, Some members of the church have an erroneous idea that when the millennium comes, all of the people are going to be swept off the earth except righteous members of the church. That is not so. There will be millions of people of all classes and of all beliefs still permitted to remain upon the face of the earth, but they will be those who have lived clean lives, those who have been free from wickedness and corruption. All who belong by virtue of their good lives to the terrestrial order, as well as those who have kept the celestial law, will remain upon the face of the earth during the millennium. Eventually, however, the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters do the sea, <clears throat> but there will be no need for the preaching of the but after a preaching of the gospel after the millennium is brought in until all men are either converted or pass away, um, that there will be preaching of the gospel. In the course of the thousand years, all men will either come into the church or kingdom of God, or they will die and pass away. In that day, there will be no death until men are old. Children will not die, but will live to the age of a tree. Isaiah says this is a hundred years. When the time comes for men to die, they will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. That's what I like to call being twinkled. And there will be no graves. It follows that missionary work will continue into the millennium until all who remain are converted. Then every living soul on earth will belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's from Bruce R. McConkie. Continuing verse 73, And the wild branches began to be plucked off and to be cast away. Those that do not accept the gospel during the millennium will be destroyed. And they did keep the root and the top thereof equal according to the strength thereof. And thus they labored with all diligence according to the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard, even until the bad had been cast away out of the vineyard. And the Lord had preserved unto himself that the trees had become again the natural fruit, and they became like unto one body, and the fruits were equal, the law of consecration. And the Lord of the vineyard had preserved unto himself the natural fruit, which was most precious unto him from the beginning. In other words, Israel was chosen in the preexistence. And it came to pass that when the Lord of the vineyard saw that his fruit was good and that his vineyard was no more corrupt, he called up his servants and said unto them, Behold, for this last time have we nourished my vineyard, and thou beholdest that I have done according to my will, and I have preserved the natural fruit, that it is good, even like as it was in the beginning. And blessed art thou, for because ye have been diligent in laboring with me in my vineyard, and have kept my commandments, and have brought unto me again the natural fruit, that my vineyard is no more corrupted, and the bad is cast away. Behold, ye shall have joy with me because of the fruit of my vineyard. These are they who inherit the celestial kingdom. And now the millennium, speaking of in verse 76, for behold, for a long time, meaning a thousand years, will I lay up of the fruit of my vineyard unto mine own self against the season which speedily cometh. And for the last time have I nourished my vineyard and pruned it and dug about it and dunged it. Wherefore, I will lay up unto mine own self of the fruit for a long time, according to that which I have spoken. 
And when the time cometh that evil fruit shall again come into my vineyard, in other words, after the millennium is over, Satan will again be loosed and will be gathered and he will gather to him all the wicked. This may mean those that are sons of perdition that have become resurrected at the time at the end of the millennium. Then will I cause the good and the bad to be gathered and the good will I preserve unto myself and the bad will I cast away into its own place. Satan and the sons of perdition will be cast out into outer darkness. And then cometh the season and the end and my vineyard will I cause to be burned with fire. In other words, the celestialization of the earth will occur when the earth dies and then becomes resurrected and becomes the place of the celestial kingdom. All right, let me just read this final thing here, um, this final paragraph. I cannot complete this discussion of the allegory of the olive tree without returning to the beginning, the reason Jacob gave the allegory. How can we be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ? If I were writing in good Hebrew style, I would expect the reader at this point to know from the allegory itself and the above discussion how reconciliation takes place. But I am not, and I would, I would be untrue to my own heritage if I did not, to the best of my ability, clearly explain how we can be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. As the allegory suggests, the process is deceptively simple and easy. Remain attached long enough to the roots. The scriptural heritage revealed by the God of Israel that the healing influence of divine direction of a knowledge of the true Messiah, our Lord and Redeemer, can change us from a twig bearing bitter fruit to a natural twig bearing good fruit. It does not matter whether our scriptural heritage is planted in a good spot on the earth or a bad one. We can bear fruit under the loving and wise care of the Lord of the vineyard. As Limhi, a man who himself had groped for reconciliation and found it, said, if we will turn to the Lord with full, with full purpose of heart and put our trust in him and serve him with all diligence of mind, if we do this, he will, according to his own will and pleasure, succor us, nourish us, and save us from destruction. Only our pride or self-will can prevent us from producing good fruit, thereby precipitating our own pruning from the tree. <clears throat> in language more related to the allegory than a first glance might suggest, Jacob stated the formula both simply and eloquently, how merciful is our God unto us, for he remembereth the house of Israel, both roots and branches, and he stretches forth his hands unto them all the day long, and they are a stiff-necked and a gainsaying people. But as many as will not harden their hearts shall be saved in the kingdom of God. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, I beseech of you in words of soberness that ye would repent, and come with full purpose of heart and cleave unto God as he cleaveth unto you. And that was by Stephen Ricks and John Welch in the allegory of the olive tree. And then in the final word here, um, the destruction of the wicked at the, second, at the time of the second coming is known as the end of the world, the final destruction of Satan and his hosts. The battle of Gog and Magog results in the end of the earth. So we've gone through the allegory of the olive tree. Um, that's, that was quite an undertaking, wasn't it? Uh, it's a long chapter, but very complicated and very uh, enlightening and very uplifting, too. Like I said, Joseph Smith could not have write, written this complicated uh, chapter. This had to be come from the mind of God to, uh, to the prophet and translated by the power of God. I bear testimony of that fact in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. See you next time.